But we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to um, just do a really brief introduction here, and then I'll turn it over to our moderator. Um, so my name is Dr. Natalie Cruz. I am the um, CIHE, ASH CIHE Communications Coordinator. Um, I have the great honor of working with a lovely team on a variety of ASH initiatives, so people that are really um, working and interested and passionate in research around international higher education. So um, we had a great turnout last month for our webinar, um, and we are super excited to highlight another one of our fabulous scholars, um, Dr. Sarah Stewart, to share about her, her book and the work that she's been doing around decolonizing qualitative approaches from the perspective of the Caribbean. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Antigone Papadimitriou, who is our chair of the Ash CIHE, and she will take it from here. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good evening, whatever you are. And thank you for being here. And this is such an honor and pleasure to have a Dr. Stewart. And also I would like to say hello with my Jamaica cup. And uh, this is uh, not only my favorite country and I visit, that's why I would like to introduce uh, this spectacular book. And also I would like just to inform that this Dr. Stewart is an associate professor of uh, higher education and students affairs and director from the uh, uh, global education in Niaga School of Education at the end. Uh, faculty director for the Global House Living and Learning Community at the University of Connecticut in the US. Uh, she was also a senior lecturer and deputy dean at the University of the West Indies in uh, Jamaica. Uh, her research is spectacular and also focus on access and equity in education and teaching and learning in local and global uh, contexts, utilizing post-colonial, the colonial, <clears throat> Post diasporic and critical and inclusive pedagogical theories. Uh, this is so impressive and also so unique and so neat uh, for the higher education, international higher education, and especially for the comparative higher education. And also, she employs both quantitative and qualitative methodologies in order to examine critical phenomena. Uh, she has a lot of uh, particular uh, publication. However, right now, I would like to invite in our Zoom, and I hope uh, you will enjoy all. And I would like to present most of your publication and also to hear from your, uh, for this particular book that was just also uh, awarded during the 2021 uh, uh, pre-conference conference. Uh, as pre yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. I appreciate it. And those overall, thank you guys for um, inviting me and for having me in the space with all of you as well. And so let me see if I can share my screen. So we'll get started. Okay, I think you should be able to see that. So I wanted to start by kind of framing out um, a little bit more about decolonization um, from this context, because very important to note is that decol um, decoloniality um, looks very different depending on the type of colonization that was enacted in the, based on the various regions. And so specific to the Caribbean is where this talk will happen, but it has you know, other implications, of course, um, for larger works in qualitative research and larger works within um, overall decolonizing research as well. And the approach, definitely want to have this more as a conversation. So hoping to get just under 35 minutes with this presentation. So to set some of the context on how I'm coming into this space, is that um, according to the United Nations by 1960, some 750 million people were under some form of colonial rule, which at the time equated to roughly a third of the global population. Fast forward to 2022, 2 million persons um, remain under colonial rule, the majority of which reside within the Caribbean and the South Pacific region. So who am I and how do I enter this space? Well, I enter this space as a first generation post-colonial citizen born and raised within Kingston, Jamaica, to be more precise. 
and born to parents who were once colonized and currently reside within the country of Jamaica. I was, I worked, paid a hefty tax, <laughs> I was educated and raised. I also lived in four other countries. And so the way in which I approach this work is that decoloniality and decolonization are subject to the subject, the context and the liminalities of regional perspectives and the intersections of power and oppression, especially between global Northern states and global Southern countries. So for example, in our book chapter with Dr. Pluim um, and myself, we wrote about a Caribbean perspective um, of global citizenship education, not in this text, in a different text on the Handbook of Caribbean Education where a country such as Canada, for example, has roughly 38 million as their population. The countries within the Caribbean re region make up more than that, 45 million. However, by and large, these countries were colonies of exploitation as opposed to our Canadian colleagues and, um, and its nation state that was categorized by settler colonialism. The literal foundation of the Caribbean region was designed to for exploitation. It was designed to support in particular the various colonists, right? And their state of economic development and their welfare. So when the mark of decolonization came around roughly in the 1960s in particular, and of course we have exceptionalities within the region, but we've seen how their economic development has been halted purposefully by various imperialistic exploitation, such as um, you know, um, Haiti, Cuba, for example, that has gone through many strifes of independence prior to most of the Anglophone Caribbean. They are still definitively ridden by um, levels of lower economic and socioeconomic development in particular. These are not afterthoughts, these were purposeful intentions because the region was never developed to, to become independent states, right? So in doing this work, and I see one of my sister scholars on the call, which I'm gonna shout out, Dr. Um, Lowen Ward, with um, another sister scholar of mine, Dr. Laurie Patton Davis. When I was doing my dissertation at the time, Dr. Patton Davis, who's ever, who has ever like, you know, worked with Dr. Patton Davis, will know that um, she's a stickler for rigorous research, as many of our scholars are. I remember a very comical story about how this work actually came to fruition, to be honest with you. Dr. Patton was on my dissertation and on my comps exam in particular. And I remember sending my comps um, into her for review. And at the time, our comps was a compilation of a heavy piece of our literature review. And my literature review was on 400 years of social education, the history of social education within the region. Dr. Patton Davis quickly let me know that if I were going to do this, I was going to do this with a level of authenticity that required significant um, archival research. And this is for the literature review. Eh? So it ended up taking me over to Great Britain and into Jamaica in particular, where I was able to retrieve much of these lost narratives, narratives that are only beholden within the actual um, municipalities of the former governor generals or the colonies, colony generals and the magistrates offices, right? So here I am in, you know, in the National Institute um, for a Library in Jamaica in particular, and there is a blue top all in that is protecting these magnificent archives in their original, um, in their original spaces and you're, they're protecting them from the sun, of course, right? And the natural elements from destruction. And I'm literally holding the only reproduction, only production of these narratives. And these narratives were in the forms of travel logs, were in the forms of abolitionist letters, were in the forms of retold slave narratives, for example. Um, when I was in Great Britain, really looking up the Emancipation Proclamation and in it and finding some of the earlier um, court trials that birthed this book, right? So I really haven't shared most of that. I haven't even told Laurie, thank you for that. But it was one of her real great suggestions that if you want to do this work, you have got to go back to the archives and to truly find the narratives that were hidden purposefully. 
And out of it really came one of the stories that is in the first chapter. And I'll just read an excerpt from it. Um, that even growing up in Jamaica, I've never read this narrative. And even in asking my parents who probably did study history, for example, um, at the high school level, it's not written, was not written in our history books either. So the narrative is, it was 1829, Massa called old Charles to pick the largest bundle of bamboo switches he could find. Reverend Mr. Bridges, rector of St. Anne, commanded old Charles to cut all the flesh off Kitty Hilton, a female Kadroon slave. She was then stripped of every article of dress, tied up by the hands, her toes barely touching the ground and flogged until the back part of her from the shoulders down to the calves of her legs was one mass of lacerated flesh. Kitty Hilton escaped and dragged her bloody body to the nearest magistrate, only to be turned away and sent back to her master. She escaped again and found a magistrate that could see her, her hanging flesh and beaten in eye sockets. Kitty Hilton did not receive justice in the formal sense because the House of Magistrates ruled 14 to four that Mr. Bridges should not be prosecuted. However, her narrative was written in the form of abolitionist letters that objected to the ruling and called for an end to slavery. 75 years later, after Kitty Hilton dragged her body, bloody body to the nearest magistrate, another Hilton woman would be born by the name of Ethel Hilton of Lucy which is some 146 kilometers from St. Anne. I came to know her as my great grandmother, the youngest of four children at, at, who at the age of 16 took a boat to the other side of the island and sailed to Kingston to start a new life. She was born between the period of post-emancipation and independence, a period of uncertainty and strict British rule. She raised five daughters, one of which would be my grandmother, and on her own was definitively known as the matriarch of her family. Before my grandmother passed, I had the opportunity to learn about her educational biography and life as a child in colonial Jamaica as a part of a grade school project. From her, I understood the importance of oral history, one that, one that was passed down from her mother to her and then to me. She spoke about her tenacious attitude and fighting resilient spirits. How she helped her mother Martel every day in the restaurant to feed all the customers. The colorful tales of colonial Jamaica between the 1920s to 1950s lined with the influx of Chinese migrants in which her father was one. Little did I know I was engaging much more than my grandmother's educational biography, but the initial drafts of what I've now termed Afro-Caribbean feminist art ethnography, a decolonizing qualitative methodology. Essentially, her interview formed a blueprint to document feminist epistemologies within colonial Jamaica. More so, her interview pointed to what some such as Rupert Lewis have called the symptoms of the colonial legacy at the psychological level and the way in which black social mobility and perpetuated values of servility and self-deprecation runs rampant within the black community. Then I was too young to predict my current role in this book project and my emerging identities as a decolonizing researcher. I didn't understand the indelible impact of my great grandmother's history rearing five young girls in colonial downtown Kingston alone. How her towering statue of just five feet would command hungry men to wait in line for hours for her delectable corned pork and freshly made crackling cornmeal festivals. As an inquisitive young girl, I have vivid memories of Martel picking the rice, that is the process of cleaning white rice, and seeing the reverence that was bestowed upon her by her children, grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. I compared her prowess as our matriarch to that of Kitty Hilton and reimagined the mirrored similarities of grit, resilience, and sheer Black girl magic within the physical embodiments of these two women generations apart. This introduction is born out of those ancestral reimaginings and my need to trace the historical underpinning of decolonizing research for and by the Caribbean. So, hence birth this book. Should probably go email Lori right after this. Right, Dr. Ward? 
<laughs> so the table of the contents of the book is set up in three different portions, right? And truly, I'm honored to have had um, the scholars that were in the space with me while doing this text, as I don't believe that there would have been a book, to be quite honest with you. All were um, from the African diaspora of either Caribbean or um, um, Afro descent. And these folks were either based in the Caribbean or working within the United States as well and different countries within the Caribbean and not just the Anglophone. And so the theorizing of the work, um, the application of the work that was done, and then lastly, which are some of the lessons, which is where where I'll probably dive a little bit into in terms of, you know, two years later what's happening with this work. So the, you know, some of these names may look very familiar. Some were, came out of that um, <laughs> very tedious um, literature review that really and truly, let's just face it, was an actual research study in and of itself. I will say that in doing that work and holding some of the pieces of the work, um, no one really teaches you about the level of embodied emotions that come from holding archival work in particular, those that would have been preventative of so many deaths and murder and genocide, and also could have led to um, freedom and emancipation from a much you know younger time so for example when i held the when i read the emancipation proclamation in particular it was written written in 1833 but they purposefully delayed the announcement till 1834 and i thought about all the lives lost in that one year span of time alone and the reason for that was that it was in order to set up for the white planter class, which again was the minority, right? Because the planter class in the Caribbean was literally probably 10% of the population at the time. And again, the societies were never built to become independent states. They were designed to fund, at the, um, whether it's Great Britain, the, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, um, Spain, or France, it was designed for these four countries to thrive. And these were the workers that designed them, right? So when the Emancipation Proclamation was read, they allowed 10 more years, which is called the apprenticeship era. So even though these were legally non-enslaved persons, they still worked in enslaved conditions, right? For 10 years thereafter. And some would argue today, you know, the remnants of that is still pretty much pervasive. So when you look at um, Cuban born, but Jamaican raised, London educated Sylvia Winter, you see the prolificness of that inter, you know, those various layers and levels of um, how so, um, Professor Winter approaches decolonizing work. We have Linda Tuai Smith that looks at work from um, the Maori people in New Zealand. You have George Dye's work, which I use a lot um, in terms of giving some honor to um, indigenous languages that were forgotten about and not written about within the Caribbean, but taught about today, thankfully. And then you have emancipatory research, which I've used to kind of ground direction in terms of why we try to do this work. So just to speak quickly about Professor Dye's work, and I'll just pinpoint a couple of these because this pushes for, I think, the work in which anti-colonial discursive work pushes decolonial work is much more in the levels of radicalism to do and for change, right? Where I think decoloniality work is definitely sits a lot within the theorizing the methodology of the process. But this work I've always um, really appreciated from Professor Dye really does the acting on and the pushing against. And so the, you know, point C, the recognition and contribution of how indigenous scholars have come before us. So for example, um, in our social studies national curriculum within um, most of the Caribbean states, Anglophone Caribbean countries, they, they do document the indigenous, which are the Arawaks, the Caribs, the Tainos that were, and they talk about the documentation of how they lived, the culture, the deities, the, um, what we have learned from in terms of the naming, right, of our country. So for example, 
Jamaica was originally called Zai Maka, that starts with an X. And that again, through the work of a lot of our archivists and historians has come through to give honor and value to our indigenous education. And what I believe has been some of the most telling from coming through this research and the text is that we've always had categories of Caribbean qualitative research, to be quite honest with you. And Professor Hyacinth Evans, who was um, formerly at the University of the West Indies, and you have a, a number of them that are here listed as well, that are in the text as well, um, will talk about the the ethnographies that were done, the travel logs, the observations, these slave narratives, the diaries and the journals. However, access to some of this valuable um, information is not there. When I was at University of West Indies, I was also chief editor of one of our oldest journals in education. And for the first time ever placed both our journals of School of Education um, online. And I was in 2016. So that's both the Caribbean Journal of Education, which is our oldest regional peer edited journal that is over 60 years old and started right after the cusp of independence in the countries. And then the Jamaican, um, the Journal of Education and Development in the Caribbean as well. So a lot of times the reason why I preface this is that citation politics is real. And it's not just about um, the thought that this work has not been done, it has access to the work is quite challenging. Hence why you saw me get a grant, head over to Great Britain, head to Jamaica, in order to go into what is called the West Indian Library um, at the University of the West Indies, which houses um, all of our um, doctoral dissertations and some are still in paper copy. So again, doing this part of work, the process of it is a process of decolonizing research, to be honest with you. You cannot always access it because again, not all of our libraries can afford Taylor and Francis and Routledge. That's just the reality. So therefore we have to go to the sources, right? Just want to plug um, some really radical colleagues I ended up working with in 2018 to currently that is Professor Camille Nakid. She's actually out of Auckland right now. Trinidadian, um, radical in her approach and um, has is the backbone of Caribbean research methodologies and methods. So not just that we are just writing books about this work, but actually setting the course and the pathways so that our work won't be co-opted anymore and not cited. So from a long time, we know we have Professor Walter Rodney, who was exiled for his strong Pan-African movement um, throughout the Caribbean, throughout Jamaica and the Caribbean and parts of Tanzania in particular, and then later would be um, assassinated in his home country of Guyana. Then you have, and so we use and honor his work that's called Groundings, which can be similarly compared to the Western context of, um, you know, focus groups, but so much radical and natural in its origin and birth. Then you have mashup as method, you have old talk, you have liming methodology. Again, liming is an actual process of dialoguing, um, but in a way that honors the culture, honors music, honors food within the process. And so these works, what, what Camille and Shakisha and a couple of other um, critical scholars have been doing throughout the Caribbean, is really paying value to the work that we've always been doing, but we're sidelined and ridiculed, both in our Creole, that, you know, in our languages, right? Um, because it was considered what we do every day and it wasn't considered valued as research. So, so just to give you a glimpse of the work, and this is in the text again, is um, the process to go about this research really was pushing to look at who were the researchers in the space. So I've spent, while doing this work, I've also spent some time really looking at the criticality of um, Black women's experiences 
as well as uh, Afro-Caribbean women's experiences versus Indo-Caribbean women experiences. There is a difference. People think that the Caribbean is a monolithic entity. It so is not. There are landlocked countries such as Belize and Guyana. There are still colonies that operate very differently. Um, and then there are br brilliant republics led by amazing um, Black sisters, um, such as those in Barbados who recently honored you know, Rihanna as one of their living female heroines. That's not a small deal, that is a big deal, okay? <laughs> so things like that um, really had us questioning in the study, in the research of the authors themselves, who are you as a Caribbean researcher? What does that mean? And to dispel the monolithic lens that because you come from the Caribbean, sun, sand, and beach, we rely on tourism, et cetera, that that's all the contribution is. And so really an analysis of self came through looking at the values, looking at your ways of knowing, understanding, language, how many languages are spoken, how we understand that. So I'll give you a couple of pieces of that and then we can wrap up for questions. So in the work that's continuing from this text is um, really developing this Caribbean, Caribbeanized decolonizing methodology. And this was, this came out from the authors themselves participating in this work. And there were three overarching kind of tenets that came through, um, which are echoed in the last chapter and in the first chapter um, from Professor Frank Tewis chapter in particular. And it's developing an intersectional consciousness, utilizing critical community-centered frameworks and methodologies, and then unleashing this, what we call the emancipatory imaginings. So just really quick, by the way, these are images and actual from the authors themselves that were navigating this process with us while they were writing their own chapters and understanding themselves um, in a decolonizing way. So the importance of the individuals hoping to conduct the research in the Caribbean context of truly getting to know their authentic selves and what that means, both the tensions, the misgivings of Caribbean based researchers and um, versus diasporic and post diasporic researchers. Um, there is a difference between those who leave home and return home and this constant tension of what we call statelessness, that feeling of navigating both the homeland and the host land, but reinforcing that both are critical. However, making sure that we situate what the units of analysis really are, the context of the work and how we are approaching that and from what level of consciousness are we doing it as well. So there's a lot of intentionality behind understanding and naming, hence why you heard me introduce myself the way that I did in troubling this idea of being a post-colonial citizen, right? And a first generation, my parents were born into a colony. I was born outside of a colony. And what, what did that mean to still have those legacies and tensions and navigating that? Also, what I haven't written about because I've lived most of my life in Jamaica, is understanding my role within the post diaspora because I left Jamaica after 16 and then returned back and what it meant to be stateless. And there were a number of us in the study um, that were navigating those tensions as well. And the liminalities of um, being on the peripheries of being both and neither nor. The second tenet that we discuss is using critical community centered decolonizing frameworks. And one of the, what you see in the background was literally the responses of um, one of the authors and um, is Dr. Yewande Fokum Lewis and uh, gave us this really engaging native tongues and how ve being very apologetic in using patwa as a resonant language, um, ver both in the vernacular, the syntax and honoring that space. And I mean, you can't see some of it right now, but she has also truly studied the Jamaican language in its formal sense, because we actually at the University of the West Indies have a Jamaican language unit. And so it formally recognizes the language and documents that process. And then overarching her work speaks to 
the valuing of indigenous epistemologies, right? Through language and honoring it, honoring that. And then when we must be forced to translate to English, we recognize that we are being forced to translate to English and that we must also do that work. I'll read very quickly because I want to make sure we have enough time for discussion and questions, right? That one of the principles that came under this tenet was that this type of work involves searching for and exp experimenting with appropriate methodologies that are currently relevant. One of our researchers and authors was a Jamaican who studies um, Afro African descent um, persons in Brazil and South Africa in particular. But so what did it mean for her to do work on Afro descent populations, but being outside of that community and culturally brokering that community. She's an anthropologist by training and very interesting work in terms of saying, you know, um, this is because cultural practices and beliefs in the Black diaspora community are often passed on from generation to generation in oral forms, such as storytelling, riddles, jokes, and sayings. In addition, the theater tradition, which is very strong in Jamaica, where entertainment for many young people begins in the church, is a setting where children are expected to perform for audiences. This means devising culturally appropriate methods that make use of these traditions and skills, thereby opening spaces in our largely Western informed epistemologies and methods to give center stage to these voices. So no longer that we put them on the peripheries, but we center the work. We also talked about the empowerment of local participants. Why are we doing this work and for whom do we do this work? So one of our colleagues was um, Guyanese and was raised in New York and then returned to Jamaica. So again, those tensions, right? And this navigating, you can literally read the tensions here. We're saying maybe the focus needs to be moved from the researcher to the focus of the research or maybe the essence of being a Caribbean researcher is not in the identity of the researcher. Maybe it lies in the identities of the Caribbean peoples who are at the center of the research and the context in which these are developed, experienced and lived, or perhaps this is the crux of being a Caribbean researcher. So you are seeing how um, this author in particular is grappling with some of that um, that tensions in the post diasporic. Unleashing our emancipatory imagination. I believe this is our last one. Yes. And so, last but not least, for why we're doing this, um, Linda Tuai Smith wrote back in 1999 about the weaponizing of research and how research has historically been used. Um, similar to education as a weapon for subordination, especially those that were um, that were being colonized, right? And in what ways do we reclaim our own research, reclaim our own education for true emancipatory reasonings? Because we are still very much situated within that colonial gaze. And so lastly, what I'll read, and this is coming from the last chapter of Professor Frank Tewitz was, you know, George Yancey in a brilliant article back in 2008 titled Colonial Gaze in the Production of the Body as Other, describes the dynamics of colonialism as a means of socially producing reality shapes colonized bodies through powerful processes of inscription. Yancey argues that there is a violent aspect of colonialism that requires a way of thinking that defines all that is good in European terms. Moreover, not only did the colonizer impose this Eurocentric way of viewing the world to justify their oppressive actions, they also coerced the colonized to adopt it in what Yancey refers to as white ideological discursive formations. Thus, if you follow Yancey's promise, premise, anyone desiring to conduct this type of research in a Caribbean context, I would argue even beyond that, has already been contaminated by way of socialization or very education to engage in colonial gazing, where we begin to betray our authentic selves and adopt colonial ways of viewing the world. So I believe that's it. And those are some of the works. <laughs> so, all right, I'm gonna click stop share.
so that we can engage in questions. <laughs> yeah, this is was a fabulous. It, it, this is really uh, outstanding presentation, and not only because of in a Jamaica just, and also reminds me not exactly because my grandmother born in Izmir in the Minoresia, mm -hmm. and I grow up with all stories. Yes. I, I visit back Izmir, I collect data and I present in a historical conference. And always I try to compare, you know, and now be in the US, US citizen, Greek, Armenian, or uh, yes. Asia. You see, those areas that are so similar in all over the world, you know. Exactly. And but there is no actually for the Minoresia, there is no country there, you know. Mm -hmm. There is no roots, there is nothing, which is really something different. Exactly. Yeah, this is excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, we appreciate it. Now, as you are very, uh, actually, we are not so, we are about uh, 18, uh, 19 uh, participants. Uh, I would like, I have one question from uh, Giovanna Vizami, and uh, also probably you can uh, turn on your mic and then you can ask this question. I think you will be interesting. Yeah. Giovanna? Yep. Oh, thank you very much. I'm trying. To, um, thank you very much, Dr. Stewart, for this brilliant presentation. Um, I come from an island myself, so I understand um, you know, the historical context you're talking about. So I'm very uh, enthused by uh, the colonial gaze. Uh, I, I must say I'm guilty of that myself and a product of, uh, of everything you've mentioned. So how do we go about clean, mm -hmm. cleansing ourselves of this so yeah. that we can engage in a, in a more authentic research, especially when we're looking at our own society? Absolutely. Um, that's a very important question. I, you know, one of the ways is that Yancy and a couple of us have now been able, because that's over 10 years of work, right, um, 10 years ago, is that for us to look away from the colonial gaze does require for us to do a lot of unlearning. I also do work looking at the intersections of critical race, white supremacy, and how um, curricula and curriculum have really been designed similar to these Eurocentric ways of knowing and epistemologies and ridiculing any semblance of um, black knowledge in particular and affirming that. And the ways in which we try to do some of that work to be quite honest with you is reading within the context that we're trying to study from, right? So when I said about citation politics, one of the things that was really critical in doing this work was who I cited and um, who I was purposefully not citing, as well as who was going to do the forward for the book, who was going to um, do the image on the front cover of the text. There are things like that that were very militant in my approach in doing the work. And I think I've just only started on the cusp of decolonizing the mind, right? So there's another a uh, book chapter that Professor Tewitt and I have about decolonizing academic spaces. And we talk about the need to decolonize in the mind. No, no, I don't anticipate that Lori intended this, but I'm sure if you talked to her, she probably said yes. You know, having me travel to these two countries to get the archives was absolutely what I didn't know I needed to do to start doing decolonizing research work, to be quite honest with you. Because what I found embedded and kind of just locked away in most of these instances was work I was not privy to or had access to had I been in the US trying to access them through our libraries. I thought about ways in which has knowledge been weaponized for so many, literally been used as this gatekeeper for those who have and those who do not have. And even for those of us who are in PhD academic programs, we still rely very heavily on our libraries, rightfully so. Those are where we pay most of our dues to access this information. I have since argued and have been since I was at the University of West Indies that if you want to do research in a regional context country area, you need to find who are their critical authors. You need to do that level of authentic work within their base country and access who are their frame, what are their frameworks? What are the methodologies that most speak to that? There is a level of cultural brokering that is required to be authentic in this process. Um, 
And so I think this is a, I think I had ended the, the, the book by saying that this is a constant work. It's almost like a pendulum swing because getting access is so easy to do when we're on this um, academic strategic game and tenure track, et cetera. But if we truly want to honor the work, do decolonizing research, it's going to require more label, definitely. I think it's 100% worth it. It makes the work that much richer, that much more authentic, and it helps us to really understand our true epistemologies and positionalities within why we're even doing this as PhDs, like why we're contributing to the canon. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, great. Thank you so much. Now I would like to invite Sona because she uh, has a, a interesting question. Yeah. Unmute. We cannot hear you. Okay, here we are. All right. I typed resounding applause for your trailblazing work. I have so many questions, but I know I don't have the opportunity to ask them all. But hats off to you. And I'm a fellow Jamaican. I have always been proud of Jamaica in terms of education, but just reading through excerpts of your work, it gave me a different perspective from my own and it challenged me personally. And so I appreciate that because I was privileged. I grew up privileged in Jamaica. I attended what was considered the best high school and so on. So my perspective was probably not the perspective of the masses who didn't have that opportunity. And for the first time in my life, you challenged me to really consider that. So I thank you for that. You, the question that I posted was, have you been able to measure or observe the impact of your work in Jamaica as well as around the world? And then where are you based now? Yeah, yeah, great question. I did hear your accent as well, Shauna. So, um, great question. I'm gonna push back slightly. So I want you here in the pushback. You know, be, for us to be able to measure the impact, as you know, is a very Western epistemology of knowing in and of itself, right? Which we all know adhere to, especially if we're in some form of the academy, it's literally written within our contracts or most of our contracts. So we can't avoid it to a certain extent. So I'm tenured at University of Connecticut. Um, I left UWI in the middle of the pandemic. I still work with Jamaica, UWI, and the larger Caribbean. When it comes to observing what the work has done, this particular text, it came out right at the cusp of the pandemic. So I'm still even learning myself, you know, where has it gone? What shores has it crossed over to? I've done a number of talks on it, right? If we measure like that, um, the citations are there for, you know, Google Scholar of who has cited the work, you know, things like that. When I look at other types of impact that I would say are not necessarily measurable, but for me as a now a tenured scholar, what I'm looking for in terms of the impact of my scholarship around the globe, it's going to be looking at the ways in which stories like Kitty Hilton, for example, are honored in ways that it has been omitted forcibly from our textbooks across the region, right? And how Kitty Hilton's story is not just honored, but the lessons of Black women overall and their experiences just using one of these, um, you know, former enslaved um, woman to tell that story. No, in history, as in the discipline and the humanities, because I was in um, deputy dean for that faculty, that impact is there. There's a lot more text about the contributions of um, Black Caribbean women to society, but not necessarily in education. And that's where those gaps have been. So the hope is that, you know, what I've seen from or younger you know, PhD students coming through is being able to utilize this work and find refuge in it, that it is allowed for us to use Patwa in our dissertations, for us to use um, Papa Pimiento, which is out of the Dutch Caribbean, for example, um, for us to honor the complexities of the Belizean um, country with the Mayans, et cetera. So for us to really do that work and not feel that we need to conform to 
or standard Western epistemologies of even qualitative research, right? Which is supposed to be inherently, you know, very constructivist in nature and um, without its limitations. But so I've gotten a lot of that sitting on committees from the Netherlands all the way, of course, to, you know, Trinidad, right? And so, and everything in between. Um, I would like this work to spread a little bit more because it is a lot to labor in this work as well. It's exhausting. Um, so I hope in a couple of years, I'll be able to measure it in different ways. But right now, those for me are, how do we create the next legacy? You know, Professor you know, Winter did this, right? For a number of us that were coming through the pipeline. So how do we continue to create the legacy so that it doesn't stop with us and that it continues to grow as well? So I hope that that is the major impact that will come from this. Thank you. A quick, quick follow up. You use terms like radicals to describe your own self. So are you finding that, for example, at University of the West Indies, do your colleagues there consider you to be radical or are they accepting of the work that you're doing? Radical is definitely one of the words. Thank God one of my sister scholars here, I'm sure she'll be laughing in the background. Um, yes, 100%. No, it's within the guise of that. Uh, I think that there are persons there that had set the pace already for doing this. And Walter Rodney is one really, you know, hallmark named example of that. Um, but there are quite a bit of other persons that Carolyn Cooper, for example, started um, the first cultural studies program in the Caribbean period and wrote, you know, you know, some very quote unquote vulgar books. Literally, those are the titles of her texts. And those books honored, you know, the culture in its raw and radical um, epistemologies without apology to it. You have Vereen Shepard who sits as the one of the hallmark historians that's the chair of the reparations committee for the United Nations right now. So you do have some stalwarts that I think have were radical way before myself. Uh, but yes, is there a demand that the fact that the University of the West Indies was was once the University College of the West Indies of London? Absolutely. And so it struggles between its colonial ties still till today. I hope that helps, Shana. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, this is uh, great. And then we have uh, probably uh, one more question from Louise, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Antigone. Uh, first of all, Dr. Stewart, my first question is, can we meet? <laughs> I like to send you an email. Listen, you got to shoot your shot here. Um, I'm really excited by your talk today. And so many of my sister scholars forwarded to me because they know I do work in the Caribbean also. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I struggled with when I was a doctoral student is I'm Haitian American, born and raised. My family, first generation American, my family's from Haiti. So my whole life, I've had this pervasive deficit conceptualization of Haiti, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, and then that was no different than in the research. And I really struggled with my doctoral research because almost every article was about how bad Haiti is, right? Mm. And so I tried my best to have a doctoral research that focused on, well, what's good and how we could build from there. But now I have this like hesitancy in myself as a researcher about talking about Haiti because I don't always access local knowledge because where do I find it, right? Um, a lot of outsiders speak about Haiti and I straddle between this insider and outsider where like I grew up in a Haitian uh, household community, but I wasn't born and raised in Haiti and being Haitian American mm -hmm. in the US is different being a Haitian American in Haiti. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about like, how do I talk about Haiti without probably not necessarily having local knowledge that's produced locally, right, yeah. um, in yeah. my research, or even if I'm writing conceptual work yeah. um, in a way that honors like the local realities and at the same time, somehow dimin diminishing my US academic training, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even know what I'm asking, but I want to- no, like, no. <laughs> 
and I'm always hesitant to produce more scholarship because I'm like, I don't want to advance deficit, but I right. always do a lot of setup about, well, if we, if to talk about today, we need to understand history and the legacies of colonization and why Haiti has been punished and all of these things. And then I have this little bit of room to say, so now, now this, right? So right. I struggle talking about Haiti because of all of these things. Yeah. What's your discipline, Louise? I'm in higher education. Oh, then listen. Okay, no. So we have got to connect. So I am currently writing with a couple of great Haitian colleagues who are in Haiti and That's they good. started Haiti and Cuba currently are the, I'm also part of the comparative. So this is, you know, international higher ed, right? Mm -hmm. So the Compar um, World Education Research Association has different um, areas. Haiti has its own chapter. It's, and um, so does Cuba. So we're doing uh, WERA, which is the World Ed Research Association, is doing these volumes coming out on their history and you know naming their chapters. So we can definitely put you in touch with some of the colleagues, right? It is going to be incredibly important that you understand that these deficit lens are coming from a colonizer's gaze, mm -hmm. um, and. It is not that you're gonna fact change. You can't change facts, but facts do have a different sense of meaning depending on whose eyes they're being purviewed from. Yeah. Um, so I always encourage my students and my colleagues that want to do this work is do not be, uh, don't let us not continue that legacy of weaponizing our knowledge, but let's see ways in which we can connect to the persons who are in country and do that heavy work. It is important. I guarantee you, it will be absolutely brilliant to do, to be quite honest with you. If you can get a grant to travel, to visit, I would also recommend that. I, I genuinely recommend that you researchers go to the country and be with persons who are living within the space, um, who are also researchers, to be honest. So you see a different viewpoint. To this yeah. yeah um and you can then do your own observations while in state and in place right doing it from away really has a tendency for us to adopt a different mindset to the work and it's not it does a disservice oftentimes to the research that you want to do which if i'm hearing the tension i think that's why the tension is there mm -hmm. as well so and i i was able fortunately to go to haiti for my doctoral research and so because of that I know that I'm, I'm hesitant and continuing to write about Haiti without actually being there or yes. engaging with folks who are actually there uh, yeah. or of Haiti. Yeah. 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 And Thank partnering you. with them. Like one partner, of the best right. things you can do is actually partner with them and partner with the research, with the work so that you're honoring that work. So that, that is also really important in this space um, to, to, you know, expand knowledge in that way. That is not just taking. We're trying to undo all of that. <laughs> That's been done over and over and over again. So <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Oh, this is uh, so great. Uh, means uh, conversation, and also uh, I see the pressure on my shoulder as a uh, as uh, means uh, in a pre-conference chair. That means I really need to in this council chair. We need the, we really need to come back again. And uh, I promise that uh, we will organize, and also here I have uh, Natalie, we can organize a webinar and then we can, uh, actually I'm a member of the Mixed Method uh, Mira Association, Jamaica chapter, that's why I visited <laughs> and, I mean, several times Jamaica, presenting mostly Mixed Method right. research. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's why I am very into Jamaica. And this is will be an interesting opportunity, actually, because as you said, uh, in the means in the US, I'm a Greek, in Greece, I'm an American. And really, sometimes <laughs> I lost my uh, that means I don't know what I'm doing and <laughs> and how people they perceive on me and maybe on my research anyway. But this is something that we would like to consider. And uh, we would like to have a webinar and another opportunity or a little further, not just only one hour. Maybe you can develop something before the uh, conference sometime in uh, uh, September. We can expand our network and Absolutely. capacity building. And this is really a good opportunity. And also 
Uh, we would like to see uh, also there is another question from Natalie and for all of us uh, about uh, what we can shoot by the book and also maybe yeah we have to figure out about your book yeah <laughs> yeah I believe it's on um, there's a, I can also send the I think Natalie you have the link to the okay great <laughs> I was like I think Natalie can send it out just before we close out there's something that um, I think would be remiss if I didn't name this in doing this work when I was talking about holding that emancipation proclamation, I mean, reading it, um, most of us, and maybe Shauna is still on the call, most of us that grew up in colonies, right? Whether it's in the Caribbean or outside, we attended schools that were bequeathed estates from plantation owners. I need that to sit with all of us. We were literally educated from being from children on former plantation estates where former enslaved. So in Jamaica, there is Immaculate, um, there is Campion, there is literally the University of the West Indies was on the Mona estate. What is important to also name, wasn't that we were just educated on these plantations, the slave quarters today remain some of the most volatile communities that neighbor these plantations, these former plantations. These are not accidents. These were purposeful geograph socio-geographical designs. So in doing this work, it cuts across us honoring decolonizing work and kind of reframing from co colonial gazing to really understand the perpetuation of servility for centuries after servitude, right? That the very design of these systems are still reminiscent till today. So our country is, Jamaica is 60 years out of, um, out of being a colony um, and still very young in terms of any form of development um, and real you know, um, economic viable development, I would say. Education wise, we've done an incredible job with our curriculum, but there are some things that are left unnamed, untampered with because it's just, either still unknowing, right? Um, and still very much, very little knowledge around these areas, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, thank you, it's so important. And uh, it seems that here uh, we would like to uh, close the, uh, the webinar. Uh, we would like to thank you all. However, before of that, I would like to, to have some information from the ASH conference. And I would like to ask Natalie to have some announcement. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Um, Stewart, for your incredible perspective and really challenging us to, to do better in, in how we research, how we author, um, and then how we think, right? That kind of final, most important stage. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple of things very briefly, and I'll email this out as well. Just encourage you, if you, if you like conversations like we had today, to please join our community. Um, you can do that through the link here. I'm going to Ash. We also, if you want to find out more specifically about our webinars, um, I will send this link out as well. And Dr. Stewart, if you wouldn't mind sending sharing your PowerPoint, I'll include it in this PowerPoint and send it out to everybody along with book information about your book. Next Thursday, we are going to have a webinar, really very kind of workshoppy, focused on submitting an ASH proposal. And so we really encourage you to, to come to our pre-conference. We're really focused on international um, higher education research. And then also the ASH conference has a section specifically for um, international higher education research as well. So there'll be some, uh, a webinar with some really tips about best strategies for presenting the best, um, submitting the best proposal. And then the conference will be in November in Las Vegas. So that's just a few quick things. I will stop sharing and let's just give a big round of applause. If you want to unmute and applause or say, say thank you to Dr. Stewart, this was incredible. And can tell it was very valuable um, for all the attendees and we will share and post this recording on the ASH website as well so that it can live on beyond just the, the folks that attended.